Good evening. Um, I'm Toshiko Mori, a professor in the practice of architecture here at GSD. And uh, I am introducing uh, my colleague and collabor sometimes collaborator, Matthias Schuler, tonight. And Matthias is a founder of Transsolar, a climate engineering consultancy in Stuttgart, Germany. He started this company in 1992. And uh, Transsolar is a leading consultancy on developing sustainable design strategies for built environment. And they use uh, computational simulations for concept validation. And they come up with innovative solutions with massive amount of analytical data and simulation and energy and comfort solutions. And their utmost uh, uh, criteria is integration of sustainability in design, in architecture, landscape, and urban design in every step of the way of a design methodology. Their goal is also to ensure the highest possible comfort in the built environment with the lowest possible impact on the environment. Now, uh, in, beyond the built environment, they have recently embarked on looking at urban context as contributor to the impact of environment, which one thinks is natural, but in the sense of uh, engineering is actually a quite a provocative and new uh, endeavor for us. And in addition, they have enlarged their scope of work beyond building systems, energy conservation, to issues of quality of human environment that includes acoustics, daylighting, natural ventilation, air quality, temperature, and in essence, the well-being of human beings, and then a quality of life. So therefore, their work is not only quantifying issues of energy and metrics of sustainability, but also they have developed the measure and the standards for quality control of a, a built environment and living environment. And I say it from the experience that they are unique in fact that first when they make an assignment or have a consultancy with architects, they will analyze thermodynamics and physics of unique design first. They are not really the engineers who add features of sustainability like bells and whistles to really tout sustainability with an S word. But in effect, but they are unique in relationship to perhaps other consultancy that focuses first on mechanical engineering, they focus on the atmosphere, the climate, thermodynamics, actual invisible performance of buildings in itself. And it's actually very, very essential that I make this distinction and it's a very unique tribute to Matthias that she, he has founded this visionary consultancy back in 92. Now, we were just talking, Matthias has started teaching here exactly 10 years ago, <laughs> the fall of 2001. And uh, I was teaching here, and Jorge Silberti, then the chair, said, Toshika, we have to s teach students something about sustainability. And Jorge, like, we can't add to this. And I said, the only way to teach it is the environmental engineer, somebody the best in the world that I know, and architect and engineer co-teach a studio together, and that's exactly what we did. And it turned out to be a really wonderful experience. But of course, Matthias being a European, he has never been exposed to what you call studio experience. And uh, he's used to giving a lecture to 400 students. He says, this is a lot of work, Toshiko. I have to do this quit every day. And then it's like eight to 12 hours. And how can I do this? It's really tiring. I have to solve every design of a student and do calculations. So yes, my dear, this is what we do in America. And we have really this very inefficient but creative methods of teaching. And he was going, oh my god, oh my god. But at the end of a semester, Matthias, uh, we have a student, actually Miho, I don't know if he, she's here. Miho was a student in the studio, now she teaches here uh, in landscape uh, department. And at the very end of the semester, we get final reviews at the very end. Um, 
he calls me sheepishly to shake up. I miss my students. I'm having a withdrawal symptom, and I love this studio system. So somehow he got hooked afterwards, and he's been with us for 10 years, and um, uh, teaching with us on environmental design and also seminars, and basically leading the effort at the GSD to integrate discipline of architecture, landscape architecture, urban design, and urban planning. And some of you are old enough, as I am, remember when you talked about fundamentals of design, that used to be what I call hand drawing. But now, fundamental design, the discipline that we share in common, is exactly the type of discipline uh, Matthias teaches in terms of climate engineering, environmental technology, yes, shall we call sustainability. That's actually the discipline and fundamental knowledge we all share together in terms of making a holistic environment. So tonight, he's going to give a lecture called Why Architects Need Engineers to Become a, a Creative Holistic Design Excellence. Is that right? I think it's like a lecture saying you need to hire me, but what can I say? I think he's brilliant and he has done designs with us and uh, I welcome Matthias. So I'm not, sorry, uh, welcome. I'm, thank you, uh, Toshiko, for this nice introduction. And it was amazing, and I think we worked with Jamie, Toshiko, Toshiko's husband in, in Berlin, and I think that was the, the connection which finally brought me to the school. And in a certain way, this intensive one-by-one -one work with the students, that's what still brings me to here, because that's what, in a certain way, is quite, intensive, but it's as well quite inspirational, even for me, because something these young brains are ticking different than our old brains, and this is something we can learn from them, so it's a give and take. Okay, so, and the title, I think this was a discussion, I and, and Ben Brofsky is the new communication head of school, which I know from Columbia, kind of uh, breathed out, so this was this, in a certain way, I took over, and in a, certain way, in a certain way, I would say design excellence today needs to include a sustainability concept. So that's in a certain way a demand of today, latest after 2007 on the IPPC report that the climate change is human made. This is a demand we have for in a certain way for certain designs. So I'm shortly defining how we, in a certain way, what we mean uh, in respect to sustainability for buildings and cities. Then I give you a bit uh, a view into what Transula, what is our approach in general doing, and then I'm trying to show you five projects in detail, and hopefully I'm done before we have to go to dinner. So, Transula, so the definition in respect of high comfort and low impact, we say in a certain way, we want to make sure people feel comfortable, high comfort, and in a certain way, indoor and outdoor. And that is the development in a certain way we made. And to be honest, Mustar City was our first master plan, as it was the first master plan of Foster, Foster and Partners. So in a certain way, we were, bo we were both kind of doing experiments on this. But out of this, in a certain way, we developed a lot of knowledge and in a certain way, we are working on this uh, today a lot. So in a certain way, thermal comfort, visual comfort, acoustical, air quality, and, and even social quality, which in a certain way is an interconnection. And some work we did for uh, the Grand Paris uh, expertise, there was a 10-team approach on Grand Paris. Uh, Nicolas Sarkozy invited 10 architectural teams. We worked with Finn Geipel from Berlin, and for example, this, in respect of this social quality, we found out that, okay, the approach should be, instead of the French people, today live on each person like 45 square meters, which is like roughly, uh, whatever, 400, uh, 450 square feet per person in Paris. And 25 years ago, they were down to 25. And in 2030, they're expecting to be up to 65 square meters. 
On the other side, we all know people are going back to the cities. So the population of the world is going back to the cities. So in a certain way, one of our findings of this uh, Grand Paris was we should kind of teach people to live on 15 or back on 25 square meters, which as a social demand then creates an unbelievable high pressure on the urban spaces. Because if you have not no space home, in a certain way you have to go out. So in a certain way, this is quite interesting that kind of out of this that we are not everybody spending his time in his 100 square meter flat, you, you have 25 and the other 75 you have in public which in a certain way would demand and maybe even make our cities much more livable. So that is uh, part of this social quality. The low impact in a certain way is clear about uh, looking on, on the climate change discussion, emissions, but as well, we have to be aware of the limitations of our resources and it's not only energy. This kind of uh, rare earth material they are needing for, for our mobiles, this is a a perfect example, copper, where 75% of the copper resources is already spent. So in a certain way, we have to be aware we are hitting limitations. And I think just these days, the 7 billion human on this planet is born. So we have to be aware all they will spend resources. So that's something we have to look at. Water, which we all know, and then waste. The tradition cradle to cradle, I think, is a great idea. And then finally, transportation. Uh, this has to be all kind of been thought of. And it's clear if you, if you deal on a single building, transportation is not so important. But if you deal on the approach of a, a neighborhood or a city, then suddenly transportation becomes important. So in a certain way, this is a diagram some of you have seen before. What is interesting. In, in our last years, we added like as well the landscape architect and even the urban designer. Normally, the urban designer should be here. In addition, what is, it, what is interesting, like in Germany, we have no urban designers as an education path. Urban designers are architects. So it's kind of a part of the architectural education, which I think is maybe not the right way to do it, but that's the tradition in, uh, in many many countries in Europe. So this is the team because the conclusion is you can approach this complex concepts only in a team. There is no way a designer gives you a direction and the rest is following it. It has to be an interaction in between the team, which as well demands some social competences in, in, in a team because you have to be able in a certain way to run it. And what was interesting, Toshiko just mentioned that in a certain way we are kind of see us as one member of this team, as well supporting the communication in between the team members. And instead of, in a certain way, starting with, uh, we are like, let's say 50% in the company, we are physicists and 50% people are mechanical engineers, but we are typically not starting from the mechanical engineering, we are starting from the physics. And it's, I just talked like a month ago to one of the heads of Arup, and he said, this is a lesson they learned that if you do environmental engineering, sustainability from a mechanical background, the danger is you always start to think in systems, in components, in chillers, in ducts, in fans, instead of thinking in basic physical phenomena which you can activate. So that, that's in a certain way what, we, what we're trying to do. In a certain way, taking all the aspects into account which influences how we feel in the building. Even the outside connection and it's for example there are studies in Germany if you have an operable window at least in in Europe you don't need a control in respect of humidity because people accept even higher humidities and even higher temperatures if they are able to open the window if you put them in a in a fixed building with a fixed facade their demand for conditioning is suddenly rising what is interesting doing green doing uh, well, by doing green, this is this is was the study d d done by uh, uh, Berkeley University, where you could show that on one side you get more out of a green building, so you can get a higher lease out of it, up to three percent. But then, finally, marketing the building on the market up to fifteen percent, and, and, and there are similar numbers, similar studies were done in Europe the effect is the same. So in a certain way, a green building is definitely in the long term is something 
you have to do as well in, in an economical sense. What is quite interesting, this is the refurbishment, the Deutsche Bank, and they even call now their towers the Green Towers, and they had a new, have a new saying which is banking on green. So they refurbished this headquarter, and you see as a consequence in the refurbishment they recycled by nearly 100%. They cut it down, the heating by 67%, electricity by 55%, water consumption by 75%. So the per kind of employee carbon footprint reduced from 4.4 to 1.6 tons per person and usability of the space was increased by 20%. And knowing that most of our cities are built, at least in, let's say, I would say even in America, and in Europe, that's something, refurbishment is something very important to look at because we have to increase the efficiency of our buildings. And this is now here 20% and thinking on the Paris example, we may need to, to extend it by whatever, 100%. That would be even more. Uh, so now, but we are even able to do this kind of buildings uh, in the US. So this is a building we did uh, with Solomon Codwell Bunz in Chicago for Loyola University, a media library uh, which in this case even have a slab integrated heating and cooling system, which in America is not so easy to do. Here we did a prefab system. The mechanical engineer on the job kind of convinced the prefab uh, 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 fabricator to integrate these pipes in the system. And it's, you know, certainly this place sitting here at the lake, this is one of the hottest spots at the university then, since this building was opened. So that's uh, quite, so in a certain way, the vote for the building is quite positive. A project we did with Peter Rose, who is here as well tonight, uh, a nice little hotel for uh, Kripalu in uh, Lennox, uh, in a certain way, where we as well, kind of thinking on the yoga people, if you come from a meditation, you go in your room, you don't want to hear a fan coil conditioning your room. So in this case, we have a slab cooling system, we have a free convection heater at the wall for heating and cooling, so it's a total silent system. So in a certain way as well, respecting that this approach in this neighborhood, you don't want, you want to look out and hear the birds and not the fan coil in your back, making sure that you feel comfortable. Uh, a building, uh, some of you uh, may know, that's the, the Wiley Theater, uh, in, in Dallas, we did with uh, OMA or Rex uh, from New York, this great building. Unfortunately, the, the concept even was designed that all four walls could go up and in a certain way, like 30% of the year, you could play outdoor because in a certain way, combining radiant conditioning, even in Dallas, that would be possible. Finally, the financial, they, they can open a corner, but not the whole, not the whole facade. Uh, a nice project we just opened uh, with Herzog de Moreau in, in Basel, which is Actelion, another pharmaceutical company. Uh, interesting, the facade concept is a triple glazing with an integrated shading device in the, in the enclosed cavity. Uh, you can imagine this is maximizing the surface. This is what we typically would call a cooling rib building, cooling fin building. But this is even Minergi, which is one of the highest energy levels uh, in Switzerland, and staying in Switzerland, jumping on the Novartis campus, uh, still kind of doing different building on this campus. This is a building we did with uh, Frank Geary on this. This is as well all triple glazed. It's a fully glazed building, even Mina GP, which is another level below the Mina G. And in this case, to fit on this, and it's hard to see, the facade is a fritted glass, but the roof, 80% of the roof is an a photovoltaic integrated in the triple glazing where Frank demanded that it's definitely not black. So we developed a gray photovoltaic which is laser cut it like 15% open so you can really see the sky, the blue sky through the photovoltaic but still very efficient but the building looks like, like quite homogeneous uh, from outside. A project we're doing and Raul just left uh, together with Raul uh, Meotra here uh, from Boston uh, here as well now in the uh, uh, urban design department, uh, a laboratory building on the campus. These guys, they are spending in the next 
whatever, 10 years, 1.3 billion Swiss francs on new buildings on their campus. They are going to build 18 new buildings on this campus, increasing even the employee a number of employees from around 4,000 to 6,000. This becomes from a production site into a research uh, entity. Even when I read today in the newspaper on the plane that they are now as well being a bit kind of under pressure and cutting out some jobs, but still there's a big movement on this. And this is a, a quite nice building. It's clear, laboratory building. You're quite toughly uh, kind of demanded uh, on kind of uh, the technical uh, side. Uh, a project which is going on, which was uh, sleeping for like nearly a year. This is a, a new high-rise building, big discussion in Paris. This is a, a project by Herzog de Moreau right at the big expo. This is as well the, the big highway around, uh, around the city. This uh, Tour Triangle is going uh, to be built. And what is interesting, it demands to be below 50 kilowatt hours per square meter primary energy consumption, which is the new Paris law, which is quite interesting. Politicians in this in the city parliament decided on an energy number, and the conservatives and the Greens were even fighting to get the number lower. I think none of the politicians has an had an idea what they were demanding. And now the number is so low that it's really, really tough to get to this number. So I think they decided. Wanted to be one wanted to be greener than the other, but finally they kind of put the level on a such a high bar that it's hard hard to reach it. And this tower is now trying to do it. We're working here in in Aspen, Colorado, with Shigeru Ban. Our first project with Shigeru, uh, this nice little a nice little museum, and it's quite interesting on this kind of the different conditions. And I think that's something Toshiko reflected when we approach a building. The first thing we do is trying to get a hold on what I call the local identity. And the climate is one local identity. It's the general climate, but then as well the microclimate. And, for, and here, for example, in Aspen, normally they heat the space around the building in wintertime to get it rid of snow. But if you compare it to a low energy building, you suddenly spend a third of your energy consumption on the passage around the building. So we had to, to find out a new solution, how to do it. We were lucky out of the Aspen, Shigeru invited us to join him for a competition for, for Swatch. There will be a new Swatch headquarter in Biel. We have to know Swatch is owning 85% of the Swiss watch industry. They bought in the last 20 years nearly all companies producing watches in in Switzerland, so this is this is Omega, this is Rado, this is every, this is all is behind. Swatch is behind all of them. So this is this will be now finally their new headquarter. Until now, they kept all these companies separate and on their own. Now they're trying to put it together, and it's like a 80 million uh, uh, Swiss franc uh, job. Uh, this is a project we are doing with uh, Frank Giri in in Arl, uh, Luma Foundation. This is it's. All connected to pharmacy because this is Maya Hoffmann from Hoff Hoffmann La Roche, who is the donator uh, for this museum, uh, who is Frank uh, is developing in all in the in the outskirts uh, of the city. A project here around the corner, New Canaan, a craze farm, which is a religious uh, kind of uh, community. Sana is doing, and in the circle, I showed the Serpentine Pavilion because you can see this is something which slowly goes into landscape because it's like a river flow on this kind of, uh, and on this flow, which has this canopy running all around, there from time to time there are buildings, there's the uh, kind of more like the, the community center, but there's a kindergarten, there's a, a kind of, uh, an eating place. So, are different programs floating around this landscape down the hill. Challenging because, okay, they want to have, they, they are dreaming on single glazing in New Canaan, but New Canaan is quite cold. So, okay, we're trying, and double facades like in, in Toledo is in discussion, but you know, certainly the client maybe doesn't have the money to spend it. So, that's interesting. Uh, an interesting development. Uh, a project we're doing with 
Renzo Piano, we are now working closely like a year with Renzo in, in, in Mailand. There's a big development uh, uh, coming up, which is interesting because we are, everybody's talking about the, the bad shape of the Italian economy. And these guys are developing 1.2 million square meters in Milan, but this is like six kilometers from the center of Milan. This is quite, and there they still say there are enough, enough people which would invest to buy these apartments. Uh, a nice project uh, we're doing uh, with Peter Sumtor. This is a medieval city, Isni, close to Bregenz on the German side. And they kind of, they have still 10 of their 12 medieval towers left. And a big part of the wall, of the medieval wall, is left as well there. But 100 years ago, they got rid of one gate because they had to extend the street because the cars were coming. Now, they finally built a deviation. So now the, the main road is going around the city. Now they are rethinking to rebuild the gate. And Peter did a, a proposal to build a tower, a glass tower. So this is a tower which is 35 meter high, the same height the old building was, built out of massive glass bricks. So the wall is like half a meter thick has a quite interesting energy performance because sun is absorbed in the glass. So the energy loss through the glass wall is much less than you would in a certain way just calculate by the conductivity. Uh, under construction, I, I have a meeting on Friday on my flight back uh, through Paris. This is the Philharmonie uh, by Atelier Chanouvel, which is really now already coming out of the ground. Still a big fight in respect of budget but it was finally kind of governmentally decided to, to push it ahead. Another Philharmony as well having some big discussions on budget because they tripled the budget uh, during construction, which is mainly during piling system because this is an old kind of warehouse which is all on wooden piles. And finally during construction they found out these wooden piles would never take the load. So in a certain way they had to spend another hundred million in the ground, which you can't see. So the, the project which first was defined with 75 million now is more in the range of 300 million. But it will be gorgeous. So and you see, no, but I think if a city in Germany can spend money on such a building, then it's Hamburg. Hamburg is the richest city in Germany. The 75 million came from one donator. There was one couple who spent 75 million euro just for starting this. Uh, we are working, a quite interesting project we are working on is the Bauhaus Dessau, the Corpus building, which is going into a big refurbishment. There's a big discussion on the carbon footprint of this building. Uh, the new head of the school, uh, uh, Oswald, he wants to minimize the footprint of the school as well. And this is, and we did, some of you may know, we did IIT Crown Hall, so we have some experience how even not changing the single glazing, because you cannot change the single glazing of the uh, Werkstatt part of this building. So how you optimize this, there are co bridges uh, in respect to you. So you have to make sure you not get condensate, you don't get kind of uh, problems in the building, but in a sort of way you optimize the performance of the building. In summer it's quite warm, still quite warm, and in winter it's quite cold. So that's something we are working on to optimize the performance of the building. Now, jumping into a bit of landscape, this is a big project uh, in Wanchao in, in China, a, a big uh, boiler production site, which is uh, Stephen Hall won the, the competition. This is a big new development. What is interesting, Hanzhou is kind of like Venice, a lot of ca uh, canals going through the city and our demand of our site development, which has as well a big water body, and we work with uh, Atelier Dreiseitel, uh, who was a Loeb fellow the last year, Herbert. Uh, we work on this to optimize that we say the water quality entering into our site, the water leaving our site will be on a higher quality than the water get, we get in, because we will work as a cleaner for the public, in, the, in this case, the water quality on that. Now, just a week ago, we won a big competition in Taiwan uh, with uh, Catherine Mosbach uh, from Paris, uh, a landscape architect, and Philippe Ram, where they are changing an old airport 
they want to revitalize into a big landscape, and it's quite big. It's like we talk about 160 acres. And this is now interesting. In a certain way, they're talking about creating a cooler, a drier, and a cleaner microclimates in this landscape. So by, by, and there's, we have like catalogs of activities, how we do a heat shift, how we do a humidity shift, how we do a local pollution shift, increasing air quality. So different parts of the, uh, of the park will have different approaches. In a certain way, it's all outdoor uh, to optimize in a certain way the outdoor climate. Now, that was the overview. <laughs> Now I'm going into the, the single projects. Mustard City, I had a long talk on Mustard City. The only thing I want to mention today, okay, 50,000 square meters. This is the, the first shot. This is like a fifth of the 250,000 square meters they're intending to build for the Mustard Institute of Science and Technology. So a fifth of the program is built, is in operation since October last year. What is quite interesting, and you remember this is the city map and it's like here in the city map, this is where the university is. Now, the approach we had in the development of the city was one of the approaches we said we wanted to create the city should stay cooler inside the city than outside. So we wanted instead of having an urban heat island, we want to create an urban cold island. And it sounded like quite uh, as a hard vision. Now, this is... Abu Dhabi today, if you've ever been in Abu Dhabi, you know this is the Manhattan. Uh, they just copied the Manhattan grid to Abu Dhabi. And what is the consequence? This is the consequence in temperature. The asphalt gets up to 57 degrees Celsius. So in a certain way, the temperature you feel walking through the street, 48 is already in the lower level. It goes up to 60. So sometimes you're lucky to reach the other side of the road. By crossing, this is why they take a car from one side of the road to the other. So, and must, uh, this is now this first 50,000 square meters. It's elevated uh, on this eight meter level where then as well these little cars are running. All the infrastructure is doing. Now this is the final building. This was the animation during the design process. Now, one wind tower kind of working as well for ventilating the, the narrow streets during nighttime because the intention was to say, okay, we're doing narrow streets, we are decoupled from the outdoor hot wind during daytime, but at nighttime, let's catch the wind, ventilate the city, get the thermal masses, so the exposed concrete, the exposed thermal mass in the streets down so we can live out of this thermal mass during the next day. You see the integrated photovoltaic kind of can delivering out into the street this kind of screens, but this is all exposed concrete. So in a certain way, this is delivering thermal mass into the, into the urban space. And you can hardly see it down here. This is now, that's the 50,000 square meters. This is the 10 megawatt photovoltaic system, which easily can feed 50,000 square meter because this is even in a certain way quite big size for this. And then in a certain way, and this is what's now even done by Foster and Partners, kind of documenting how the performance is. So looking on this and doing the same picture than we saw before, now you see we are now nearly 10 degree cooler in this space than if you go back uh, to, the, to the existing today Abu Dhabi. So in the, certainly the approach and outside air temperature are even higher than the indoor felt temperature. So we are not yet there that we wanted because we were expecting to be even seven, maybe even nearly 10 degree cooler than outside. But at the moment, it's just a limited spot. And I think we are quite uh, positive that if this grows on in this density, we will be able to, to get the temperature even further down. Energy numbers are not yet available, but they, in October, they sought after one year, but it will take them another two months to get the first energy numbers if this kind of first 50,000 square meters fit into the expectations what we had. A project you may have heard about, this is the Manitoba Hydro project in Winnipeg. Uh, Manitoba Hydro is one of the big electrical supply companies, and they decided to move their office, which was in the outskirts, and I don't know, I have no, no picture, in the outskirts of Winnipeg, this is Winnipeg, so it's quite far north. Uh, 
and you can see the big lakes. So this is where all the power is coming from. It's mainly hydropower. Uh, to move their headquarter, which was in the suburbs, back into the city, back into a place in a city which is quite calm. So putting another 2,000 working, uh, sorry, this is German, 2,000 working places back into the city, interesting-wise as well, building only 80 uh, parking lots in their, in their underground parking, and there is no restaurant for this building. They, they get kind of uh, bonus cards to go to the surrounding restaurants during their break. So in a certain way, they really, this was a clear intention to bring another 2,000 people back into the city, which should make this city livable. And I think that's a quite interesting approach that even a company like this kind of say, okay, we have as well a responsibility in our society, not only in respect of clean energy, but as well in respect of, the, let's say, the energy of our cities. So then, okay, project goals quite, so it should be a quite uh, healthy building, 60% below uh, the kind of the Canadian energy level, lead gold, and still in a available budget. The, the budget was quite tough. Uh, we worked on this KPMB, I didn't mention the architects from Toronto. Uh, this is kind of the approach now if you would look into the climate analysis, and I skipped it in my presentation, of Winnipeg, this is one of the most sunniest places in North America because it's getting really cold, going down to minus 35 Celsius, up to 40 sometimes, depending on the chill factor. But then it's getting very clear. So it's very sunny. So we opened up the building. This is now facing south. We opened up the building to the south, creating this kind of three, six-floor high winter gardens, which in a certain way work at that time as a solar preheater where we catch the low sun even on this vertical facade uh, to make this. So that's the winter garden. That's our solar preheater. And then there are the offices around the perimeter. The perimeter in a certain way is a double facade, a double facade twice double glazed because we were a bit afraid on condensation and there had been some bad experiences with double facades in Canada. Leaky buildings with a double facade get a lot of condensation or ice in the double facade. So we ended up with uh, two times uh, double glazing and people uh, kind of comparing the system, typically suspended ceiling going to a higher place, uh, to a higher space with a kind of raised floor where you supply uh, the fresh air where you have as well uh, the cabling and then expose the ceiling with the embedded uh, slab cooling system which is connected uh, to a geothermal system. So you, on one side, even were gaining space height, even to feed the spaces deeper, uh, the natural light deeper into the building. The winter garden here kind of listed in the winter mode where the fresh air comes in, which is partially preheated by a heating, heat recovery system, but then taking as well uh, the solar gains in, and there are two big water walls at the edges of the winter garden to do a natural humidification of the intake air. Uh, the airflow then from the winter garden is going into the raised floor, and the building to give you, this is like 35 meter long, so that's around 100 100 uh, feet long, this building. There is no collection of exhaust air. It's just collected at the end of this open space in the north, in a northern shaft, which in summertime goes up to a chimney, in wintertime goes down to the basement, uh, feeding into the heat recovery system. So the supply is coming all through the raised floor locally, but then the exhaust is just collected because we are not mixing the ventilation, the air in the space, so we get a, a very stable stratification, so we can collect the exhaust air even in a three meter high space and shift it or collect it even on a length of around 100 feet to the, to the exhaust shaft. Now the same system now uh, working in summer, where in a certain way we open up the winter garden as a flushed space, we can use the water walls, which are connected as well to the geothermal system for a partially pre-cooling and evaporative cooling, and then the air is taken in, and depending on the demand can be a kind of a 
little further conditioned into the raised floor, but people can at the same time open up the windows uh, to the outside, so in a certain way, uh, they are allowed to use their facade. The exhaust in this case is collected in a big solar chimney on the north side, uh, in a certain way, even having a solar kind of uh, superheating device at the top to push the air in addition out of the, out of the space, out of the building. Uh, we did a detailed uh, daylight analysis around, uh, the depth of the building is around 11 meters, so we talk about like 30 feet from the facade to the center, and we can nearly feed easily 60 to 70 percent of this with natural light. They are typically, the, the meeting spaces are along the inner wall, and then the permanent working places are close to the facade with natural light. A big disappointment from our side that the interior design was done by another architect, uh, which we had the biggest fight with to keep these cubicles down to 1.5 meters, because first they were 2.5 meter high, so there was no light even reaching the corridor. So in a certain way, that's kind of where then you suddenly are falling back to fighting. Okay, nobody in Europe would ever built today cubicles, but in a certain way, in North, in North America, it's still a big fight. And often, the interior design is done by another office than the building. And then you suddenly have another party to fight with. So that's not, that was a, a big battle we had here. Uh, yeah, energy concept. In overall, you see the geothermal piles at the bottom there as well, providing through a geothermal heat pump uh, the heating for the building, the building is now since one and a half years in operation. They had some problems to get the geothermal system working. They were running the building the last two winters on gas, but they were totally amazed on the low gas consumption they had even to run this building. They said, these are like two boilers. The guy who is running it from the facility management, he said, these are like two boilers I have in my house, and they are now running this whole building. So in a certain way, understanding that suddenly the heating consumption, even in such a cold climate, is going rapidly down. Uh, we're expecting the first energy numbers are a bit higher than expected to have a reduction compared that this is the 60% demanded uh, to the Canadian standard. At the moment, we are more, after the first year, we are more in the range of like 65 to 68%, we still see some optimization uh, possibilities of the system, So, and the building is monitored, will be monitored over five years. And that's in a sort of way the appearance of this building in the, in the center of the city. Where now this was looking from south, this is now looking on one of these big, that's like the west facade, and then you see kind of the big north shaft with the exhaust, and then finally the solar chimney on top Kind of it was interesting because our studies showed them that a lower building would work better in respect of compactness and still feeding enough light for people. And then the heads of the, the CEOs were kind of, they wanted to build the highest tower in Winnipeg. So finally, now the solar chimney is the highest point. So they beat their competitors, but the building stayed compact. We didn't have to extend it just to make sure it's higher than one of the neighbors. But that's interesting. Suddenly you, you uh, kind of be faced with this kind of arguments. Now jumping from, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, from uh, Winnipeg into Abu Dhabi, totally changing the climate, this is our concept or the concept we are working with uh, Atli Chanovel for the Louvre Abu Dhabi. And some of you have, may have heard the rumors that at the moment the the projects are on hold. It looks like the political heads of the United Arab Emirates, which is what I learned from an English guy, described as a non-elective system. They are quite alarmed about the Arabic Spring movement. So that's why, in a certain way, at the moment, the projects are on hold. The Louvre, we have the, all the contract documents are finally kind of, uh, even now, since a year in, they have, they were very close to appoint a contractor, a general contractor for, to, for doing it, but they finally didn't do the step. Now, the approach for this building with this big dome, just to give you, this is 180 meter diameter dome, around uh, 40 meter high from the bottom to the top. Approach, it 
doing some shelter, mainly solar shelter, but then there are big sandstorms being happening down there and as well creating a microclimate. This was the approach to create a microclimate on this nice island, which is putting into, into, the, uh, into the Arab Gulf in front of uh, Sadiat Island. Now, and the idea uh, Jean Nouvel had was kind of that this stone should kind of be like a light filter, which we know from Oasis, where in between the palm trees, you see this flickering of light going down to to the trees. So that was, in a certain way, the background. And this is one of the animations you, all of you, have seen before, where this is what Sean describes as the rain of light. Now, we had the nice job to make sure that this rain of light is appearing at the end, that this pictures will really work. And it was interesting because he explained us and he showed us his new, he did the swimming pool building up in Le Havre, which is this white building with as well some uh, uh, big openings. And he was expecting to have light patterns on the floor. But there's so much light in the building that you don't see any patterns because it has too much too much windows, which means there are no patterns happening. And this was the biggest discussion. We said, if you want to see this, you have to get the light level in this dome really down. And it was quite a, a, kind, of a, a kind of a discussion. And you see it in a moment. OK, that's the climate for Abu Dhabi, where the sun in summer comes really from the top. So it really comes from the Senate. We looked on, this is our office in Stuttgart. We did a test about uh, what a little hole, what a shade does this hole create in a distance of 40 meters. So depending on the size of your opening, depending on the size of your kind of solid parts, it's partially disappearing. So you have to be aware on this effect because this will create the pattern. And first, we were even thinking what creates this kind of uh, effect and it's created by the divergence of the sun because the sun, compared to its distance from the planet Earth, still has a certain diameter. And this diameter is creating this divergence, which is at least in a distance of 30 meters, with a, uh, easily creating 14 centimeters of deviation. So if your holes get getting too small, and this is now Using radiance without the divergence, it gets sharp, sharp shadows. If you put the divergence in, you suddenly can see that small, ho small holes are disappearing. And if small holes are disappearing, they only add to the overall pink light, background lighting, which killing the rain of light. So it was kind of, and out of this, we developed a kind of advice how big the holes should be. This is the pattern of the, there are two layers of dome. Each of the domes is out of seven layers of a very geometrical Arabic grid. And they're just shifting them, rotating them and shifting them. And this creates this, what in the first moment you would say, a totally chaotic system. But it's based on seven level and seven layers of absolutely geometrical Arabic patterns. And the same one for the lower one. And then the overlay, in a certain way, we evaluated now how much light you would get in. Now, what was interesting for us, now this is a daylight factor, let's say whatever, 1% 1% in Abu Dhabi where you get up to 140,000 lux. This is 14,000 lux. But how you show an architect, because we were alarmed, we would by calculation determine the light atmosphere below the dome. But how we would prove that the light atmosphere we are calculating and we are demanding is the light atmosphere the architect had in his mind. And there is no instrument to show real brightness, real contrast. There is no paper, no screen, no projector who is able in a certain way to reproduce real contrast. So that's why we decided we have to go in a daylight laboratory where we have to be able to do outdoor intensity or putting the same model, this is a 1 to 200 model, uh, even under the real sky, under a real tilt. And then Jean Nouvel had to sit there. And we were exchanging the dome. We were exchanging, we were exchanging like the roofs on the buildings. This is now below the dome. You can imagine the reflectivity of the roof of these buildings has a major impact 
on the amount of light you get under the dome. So he was sitting there for four hours. Kind of, we were changing the dome above his head. We were changing the reflectivity of the ground of the roof. He was smoking cigar because the cigar created the dust for the beam of lights in a certain way. So, but we could get him there for four hours and finally it was interesting because we finally ended up with the darkest combination, with the lowest kind of perforation in the domes, with the darkest colors, was the atmosphere he had in mind. And these are some pictures out of this one to 200 model, uh, how the light pattern in this case looked there. Now, out of this, it was clear we wouldn't be able to do it with a one-to-one -one mock up. So this is the one-to-one -one mock up, which is a, what they call the Abu Dhabi UFO, which is a 40 meter high building where one of these roof elements were installed with the two layers where we could do tests to ensure the rain of light. These are the, uh, all the mechanical drawings. This is done in collaboration with Bureau Happel. They are doing all the engineering on this job. Now, and this is kind of the element that we had up there. So we were kind of saying, okay, now let's first test one of the central elements. We couldn't do the whole dome, it's clear. So one element, so we would be able to have it here and we have to be able to show it with the 40 meter height. Now this is showing in a certain way, that is what we were expecting to get or what the animation of the Atelier Jean Nouvel showed. Now, when we totally, in a certain way, blacked out the space, you could see the rain of light. Because in Abu Dhabi, and that's now interesting, coming back to local identities, the dust is a local identity. The dust is the base for the rain of light. So in a certain way, explaining the Sultan that the rain of light is something which is really connected to their location, he said, that's the first time in my life I see the dust in Abu Dhabi as something positive. Until now, we only have to clean our cars three times a week. That's the result of the dust. Now I see the first kind of positive kind of outcome of this. So, but you could see, now this is now pitched out. Now if we added an opening and you could see the dome at the edge would allow some light to get in. If you open up like this was a, like a six meter high door at the edge of the dome, suddenly already your kind of rain of light was disappearing. We tested it for an element. There was a floor you could lift up to the edge. So kind of you tilt the element and in a certain way you re replace the geometry to fit this geometry. And in a certain way we had similar problems depending on what side light you get, uh, the rain of light is happening or not. Now this was now in this little element amazing that you see now this was okay that's shown in the Sheikh Sultan which is the nephew of the uh, of the president of Abu Dhabi who is responsible for all cultural buildings so looking on this they liked it but then they looked into the 1 to 33 model which was made out of shiny aluminium and they were totally kind of uh, not very positive because Sean was like Matthias where's the rain of light I said Sean this is too reflective. We told you before, you insisted on shiny aluminum. So it's like a lesson, you have to do one to one. So he was standing there, there was no rain of light because you could easily see all the reflection coming from outside being reflected on the inside of the aluminum, creating under the dome 2,500 lux. In, the, in this one, we had like 150 compared to 2,500. That's worlds in between. So we had to dim this down to a lower level. So, but then, how we prove that in a one-to-one, -one, in a one-to-thirty-three model, we could see the rain of light because light is scalable, but we find out that the dust is not scalable because the depths of the dust of the air layer, the light is going through, you cannot scale. So what we did, we built a model of the mock-up. So this is a 1 to 33 model of the big mock-up of the UFO to in a certain way to define the amount of, in this case, haze we were pushing in there as replacing the dust. The amount of haze we have to put in here to get the same picture, the natural dust 
is doing. So that's the picture of the 1 to 3, 33 mock-up, and that's the 1 to 1 mock-up comparing. So that's how we calibrated the amount of haze we could push into the 1 to 33 model, and this is now the 1 to 33 model being rolled out of, out of the big UFO uh, on the south side. And these are the pictures which in a certain way, depending on it, it's quite dark. So the total transparency of the dome is like more in the range of 1%. There's only 1% like uh, kind of uh, open uh, in, in, in the middle. And then you get and you need a dark gray at the inside. We had long discussions with Nouvel because his intention was to get a white space. And I said, Sean, if you get it white, the reflection will kill the rain of light. So to understand that in this space, even the gray looking up, even a white surface would always look gray because in the contrast to the light, it's not as bright as the, light, the beams of the light are. So in a certain way, but this needed really one-to-one -one kind of models to show it, to show him uh, that this would work. So finally, we now defined the color. So this is all then finally put into the specs. And in a certain way, I told my guys on this job, this is our big responsibility. If this building finally is done and the rain of light is not working, we have a big problem with this architect because that was our main job to make sure that this is working. And it's clear all these openings are as well, or the closing is as well the biggest shade for the space because that's the other point. Looking on the climate below the dome, you see in Abu Dhabi, it's going up to 47 now. The gallery climate is down here. Now the human outdoor acceptance may go up. No, indoor, this is the indoor comfort, which goes up to maybe 28. And then the outdoor acceptance may go up to like 32. So there is a big time of the year. And interesting, they're building this museums not for the Emiratis. They're building these museums for the Europeans and the North Americans because they're expecting us to go there for holidays. Now, unfortunately, we are traveling in July, August, which is the hottest time in the year. So we were, first we were arguing, okay, Emirati people would not come. They said, we don't care, but the Europeans and the Americans, they will come. So, and they will go for breakfast at 10 and at 11, they are at the museum. So at the worst time of the day, this is when they hit the place. So that was a big discussion, and it's clear you do all this effort on this outdoor plaza, and if this outdoor plaza would be too warm, nobody would enjoy it. So that was our intention to say, and this is interesting, 47, this is now the temperature in the shade. If you measure the floor temperature, it even goes easily up. That's similar what we measured in Abu Dhabi downtown, easily go up to 60, 65 degree on the asphalt. And then the, the felt temperature of someone feeling the air temperature plus the surface temperature would be more in the range of 55. So in a certain way, if you come from outdoor, being exposed to the sun, and you come below the dome, in a certain way, you will already do a quite strong experience because it will automatically, in the shade, cool down. We still, we are going uh, to think on the microclimate. The big effect we still were looking at, and this is now a, a fluid dynamic, on how the wind is going around the dome, because the dome being open at the edge and as well open with the holes, the airflow over the dome is creating a certain suction. So you see some arrows which are below the dome going around the buildings. Most of the air is going around, but then there's a big kind of negative pressure happening at the backside. So you see this air flowing under the dome. This is for us important because it, in a certain way, determines how our microclimate we are trying to take care of is kind of being blown away on this. So this is now a section on a level, I think this is around uh, two meter above the plaza level, how the airflow is going. And certainly we even, at one point, we totally mirrored the building, the design approach for the building, because we find out that for the main wind direction, it comes from the northwest. The building, the, the first design was just not optimal. And we said, Jean, if you just mirror it by reflecting this building, instead of being up there, you bring them down, and this guy being down here going up, it's much better, and they did it. So in a certain way, 
it, there was no kind of, it was a layout, but he said, if we flip it, in a certain way, the layout is still working the same. The people are just working in the other direction. But for the wind, it was a big, a big measure. Yeah, and then you see how this, the wind is clear. The wind speeding above the dome is reaching high velocities, so it's sucking some air from inside. You get turbulences, and this is the, the area where we wanted to achieve the highest or the lowest, the highest comfort. So what the system has, we have a floor cooling system on the plaza, and we have like what we call an air, uh, a bus top of cold air. So this is spill air because everybody leaving the museum, which is fully air conditioned, and we all know this from, I always, if I go to Asia and you walk around uh, along a street and you get all the, along the, along the uh, shops and the door opened up, you get all the cold air flowing out into the city. So the intention was to have, if we could grab all this cold air, everybody by leaving the museum is kind of spilling out. We grab it in like a bus top where the cold air stays at ground level, we cool the floor in addition, we could improve easily the comfort by 10 degree. This demands in addition that the inside of the dome should be low E, which means because up here we easily have 50 degrees Celsius. We don't want to stand below a radiator which is burning us with 50 degree. So this has now a low E coating which means it doesn't emit the heat. In addition, it works like a reflector. So that's our Bangkok airport approach, which hopefully is not flooded these days. Uh, that the cold floor, instead of you see the hot ceiling, the cold floor is reflected. So looking up, you can think on it this visually. If this would be visually a mirror, you would look up and you would see the floor. The same works in thermal radiation. In this case, it's, you, do, you don't see it, but your body sees the long wave radiation from the floor reflected in the ceiling instead of seeing the high temperature of the ceiling. So what was a nice or, or a demand by the Louvre in Paris, they said, if we are spending kind of electricity, which is produced in Abu Dhabi by gas turbines to cool outdoor spaces, and if this is in one day in the French newspapers, we are dead. So it was absolutely clear all this energy had to come from renewable sources. So finally, the building got a big geothermal system. Now, the, the problem with geothermal system in Abu Dhabi is the mean annual temperature is 28 Celsius. So there's no cooling. But what is interesting, the shallow Arab Gulf, which is only typically 30 meter, like 100 feet deep, it gets very hot in summer. It goes up to like easily 90, 100 degree Fahrenheit. But in winter, it cools down because there's not a big mass. And the re-radiation to the sky, especially at the, co at the kind of along, along the edge of the Arab Gulf, you get easily 15, 14, 13 degrees Celsius. So we were catching this water in the winter, charging our geothermal system, resetting it by the cold water of the Arab Gulf during the winter period, and we could store that we still had in summer 22 degrees Celsius. We're expecting. It's not proven, but our models showed that we would be able to get 20 degrees Celsius, 2 degrees Celsius, out of the ground even after half, this half year period, which would be enough to keep the surface at around 26. So that was the kind of improvement that instead of going up to 42, we expecting only around whatever, around 4% of the time that the outdoor spaces would be above 34. There were a big discussion, can it be 34? Finally, the client insisted that there is a tunnel that you can go underground from one museum to the other instead of crossing the plaza. I think everybody would cross the plaza if there is 34 doesn't kill you. If you walk 25 meters, this is 25 meters to walk from one museum building to the next. Okay, now jumping from Abu Dhabi, we are already close to Africa, into Africa. This is a, a project we are working on at the moment and this has a strong connection to the GSD, because these are 
former GSD students, which are running a company, some of you may know it, which is called Mass Design Group. Here in Boston, they are all over. And I remember a discussion, I, I think Peter, uh, Peter Rose was as well there, out here on the corridor with, this guy, with the guys when they built their first, when they're working on their first hospital, uh, where they were approaching it with natural cross ventilation. It was on a hill and they were kind of, and it sounded like quite visionary. And I, I guess it would ne be never built, but finally it's built. So, and they are now working on a new, uh, uh, on a new hospital and they approached us in a certain way, uh, how to do this. Now this is, we are in Rwanda. In a certain way, the first building which is built is down here in Butare. That was the first hospital they built. Now they are going in Nyanza for a renovation and an extension of an existing uh, hospital. And it has told me, okay, if we go to Rwanda, this is the sun, which means in the worst case, in summer, it comes from the north, 70 degrees Celsius at noon. In spring and fall, it comes from right from the top and in winter, it comes from the south. So it's a quite top sun, so means horizontal surfaces collect a lot of sun, but thinking on a solar chimney, and they were first talking about a solar chimney, a vertical surface wouldn't get so much sun because you wouldn't, it wouldn't be hit by the sun. So, and then looking on the temperature, it's interesting, it's on, a, on around 5,000 feet above sea level, so that's a quite high level. And you see, can see it in the temperatures. The temperature are reaching rarely in the range of 80, maybe sometimes 85, but then at nighttime, typically, they drop down in the range of 60. So you have like nearly the whole year a similar climate. So you have a day-night swing, which you can use, which is interesting, the wind is not very dominant. So either you have a very exposed site, then you can use the wind, or the wind will not be enough to run your ventilation system. We have to have in mind, it's a, it has like a very heavy rain period in April. A lots of rain and then there's like more a dry season in summer. Now this is the hospital they built uh, in Butare, which is totally naturally cross-ventilated. I think the big advantage is it's really exposed on a hill. So they really can use the main wind direction. This is the section through the building. So to do it, now the intention is, and they work together with uh, here uh, uh, the health uh, science group in Harvard uh, at, uh, that in a certain way you, de you need a certain cross ventilation amount in a building otherwise the spread of diseases by airborne uh, spread is, is very dangerous. What is interesting if you look back in history until the 1950s nearly all hospitals were really nicely naturally cross-ventilated. And then they started to install mechanical systems to take over. Now today, 80% of the time, these mechanical systems are not working. Either the fan is broken or they're out of, the grid, is, grid connection is gone. So in a certain way, this was a kind of a rethinking on that we should, the building should do it naturally. So that's kind of how the building looks like and it, it's quite a su success. And they are now working with uh, UNICEF uh, and the local, this is the existing Nianza Hospital. And the, and the intention was how we should build this now. This is not exposed to the wind. What, what, are, what is the possibility now? Thinking on the day-night swing, this is again nighttime 16 Celsius, daytime 30 degree Celsius. So that's our kind of potential we have. And if I say the indoor temperature, let's say, would vary in a range between whatever, 18 and maybe going up to 27. There is a problem for a, for a standard chimney because the standard chimney works if inside it's warmer than outside. We know from our oven, then our chimney works. If it gets colder inside, uh, colder inside than outside, then it suddenly may reverse. So in a certain way, we see a lot of the time when outside and inside temperature are similar. So a chimney wouldn't work because there would be no driving forces. And even if kind of sometimes at nighttime you would get some ventilation, but at daytime it even would be dangerous, it may reverse because suddenly the warm air would fall down your chimney. So it's clear we needed support 
to guarantee this high ventilation rate, and they typically talk about 12 air changes. 12 air changes is a lot. 12 times the space volume in one hour. That's really a, a big flow. So that was our first sketch, is thinking about to say, now, if we have this sun coming from the top, why we can't use the roof surfaces instead of the chimney, using the roof surface in a certain way to do what I call, and I don't know if, if this is the right description, a kind of a, a, a superheating of the exhaust air. So the air from, coming from the room is heated up easily in this cavity to around 40, 45 degrees Celsius, which then suddenly creates our temperature difference to the outside. So we are using the roof surfaces to run the system. Now at night time, the chimneys in a certain way would store with a big thermal capacity some of this heat. So at night time, some of the air would go out and still be heated in the chimney, at least let's say for between uh, sunset and dawn uh, or in, in the like four or three hours where the outside temperature and inside temperature are similar, if nighttime really drops down to 16 and you're warmer inside, even 22 to 16 would be naturally a certain chimney effect. So the capacity should have a certain effect of certain hours to feed the, the natural ventilation. Now this is, the, this is the layout, this is the existing hospital, that's the new tracks they are building. Uh, one kind of point is that the, the site is kind of stepping down here and they are introducing a second level, which made it a bit more complicated because doing a second level natural ventilation with a solar chimney becomes a bit... So this is now the layout of all the chimneys and they were quite astonished when I kind of sized the chimneys. I sized the chimneys to have low velocities because if you look back in literature, the old hospitals, they had air changes 30 to 50 air changes an hour. So the, like the um, tuberculosis clinics we had even in Germany from the last century or in Switzerland, they had great natural ventilation systems to reach to this high ventilation rates. So the sizing of the chimney is quite, and this is now the real section. So we really talk about a chimney which is like three by four meters. So a big chimney. Now this is what I described before. So that's the section where the exhaust air from the, from the hospital room is superheated, then going out the chimney. Now, and this is the same now in the other direction. So this is the collection duct, which runs horizontally and then ends in a chimney. Now, how we are ventilating a lower level room, which doesn't have the superheater for the chimney, we did a double layer chimney, so the chimney heats up, so the exhaust of the one zone heats up the chimney, which in a certain way supports the ventilation of the other one, which has a double height chimney, easily like instead of four meter, eight meter high chimney. So uh, even if the temperature raise is not as high as the other one, the chimney will still work enough to suck enough air through the building to feed this. So that's in a certain way looking on the air arrows, coming through the facade, being the upper one exhausted through the double layer roof, superheated going out, and the other one in a certain way going out, but then the heating is happening in the upper part of the chimney, but by kind of heat transportation from the one chimney chamber to the other. We discussed a lot on materials, on local materials, which are able uh, to build the chimneys out of, and we were demanding a lot of thermal mass. And these are finally the animation, and which scared them a, a bit, and they were kind of discussing a lot internally, because these chimneys are quite dominant. So this is a massive impact. So this building is really dominated by this, by this approach. On the other side, if this is replacing any kind of mechanical ventilation, the sun will be always there in Rwanda. So in a, even if there's no more electricity, this system would work, kind of feeding the system, and there are no going into construction documents, so this is happening, this is quite fast, uh, and they are expecting that it should be built uh, during next year, they are starting construction. And this is just kind of a picture I just grabbed from their web page, and some of the people may be familiar, I think two or three of them I, at least had been my students during the last, during the last years. So that is quite interesting that you see these people kind of spreading out there. And I think what they as well did, they were jumping into a market where architecture was not valued because 
these people from UNICEF that we need a hospital. We cannot deal with high-level design because high-level design is something for, this would be a German saying, for dentists, so, but not for a hospital. Dentists are being the synonym of rich people in Germany. Okay, so finally we're closing off with the cloud and a lot of you have seen, some of you maybe uh, were, had the chance to be in Venice to see the cloud. We were lucky to get the invitation by Katsuyo Seshima to join the Architectural Biennale and this was like to be invited as an engineering company to do an installation on an Architectural Biennale. So this is Venice, and Venice and clouds is something which is really, if you are in Venice, you can imagine there are gigantic or kind of astonishing formations of clouds because the, the, the mountains are right behind the city. So in a certain way, it's an edge where the climate from the mountains and the climate from the Atria are hitting each other. And you get wonderful cloud formations above the city, so it fitted perfect into the city. Now, okay, we looked on how are real clouds happening and in a certain way it's like depending on the temperature and the humidity level it's rising up and the pressure drops and by dropping the pressure and having some seeds you get condensation now but the temperature typically is decreasing but the pressure is as well decreasing and these two influences are making it we wouldn't be able to do this in a real building because we only had seven meters to do it, so in a certain way, we had to reverse the process to say, we have the cold layer at the bottom, we have a warm, very humid layer where the cloud is, because a cloud is, if you have 100% humidity and you have enough condensation seeds that you really create droplets and they have to be small enough not to start to rain, still floating in the space, and you need a hot layer on top because humidity, humid air is lighter than dry air. So humid air is tending to raise. So you need a hot layer at the top to prevent this from raising. Now, we started in April in a cabbage storage in Stuttgart. Stuttgart is quite known for cabbage. Uh, sauerkraut, we call it. And we did some tests in Stuttgart. Katsuyo Seishima was there and she liked it. And then we said, okay, now let's go to Venice. And I think my guys were there for like four months in preparation of the Biennale. So they started like in April. Being there, we had even one GSD student who joined us luckily uh, for this four months living in Venice. This was the test space. So there is, we worked with uh, Tetsuo Kondo, a, a young Japanese architect who was supposed to do the kind of a, the ramp because the intention was to do a cloud where people we, would be able to walk through to experience the cloud. And this ramp is a story on its own because this is all protected. This space is from 1540. So this is like 500 years old. You are not allowed to drill in these columns. I can't, we spend some kilograms of silicon here to tighten the space up in respect of air tightness, but drilling in the, some of these historical, there was no way to drilling. So that was a structurally. So this is now the infrared picture on how the cloud worked. So in a certain way, you have the cold layer at the bottom. We had big chillers. They are creating a cold layer. We were dumping the heat of the warm side of the chiller above the cloud. You had to do it without creating turbulences because turbulences are the enemy of stratification. So that was a big challenge. And I can tell you like five o'clock the day of the opening, I was still there and we were kind of still struggling to get the clouds stable. So it was quite intensive. My project engineer, I think he didn't sleep the last three nights. So this was quite uh, a hard, uh, test, but it worked finally. It worked for four months. For the whole Biennale, it worked perfectly. Depending on the amount of people, sometimes the cloud disappeared. And it uh, certainly, it showed that we are, as human beings, we are influencing the cloud. We are influencing our climate. So if you approached it, you could see sometimes the people above the cloud, then there was the cloud layer, and then the people below the cloud, there was this ramp, which was supposed only to have 15 people on the ramp but I saw 50, 100 people up there. 
it partially moved easily like five inch, sometimes 10 inch. So this was quite, but it was an experience. You were not working on solid cloud, ground. You were walking on a cloud. It was really kind of not stable. It was quite moving. So this is the, uh, they sh there had been people to control it, but I think there were a lot of people there. And in a certain way, if you were lucky, you were walking through the cloud, and this was like the first time in the morning when we kind of, you could see single clouds even floating through the space. And if you find, in a certain way, it was changing the whole time, and Moisen, Moisen even told me he was there, and he was in a certain way totally kind of thought, oh my God, this is not working. There was, so he was already gone to the next rooms, and then he met someone and said, have you seen the cloud? Unbelievable. So Moisen had to go back to see it, and then he saw it the second time it was there. So in a certain way, it really changed, and hopefully the people who had been there saw it in, a, in, in such a where you kind of entered up and you kind of were really above the clouds. So this is my last slide. Concluding on this, and this is about design ex excellency and in a certain way, in my case, sustainability, I say, my saying would be, we can see sustainability as a must for our survival, but as well as a chance and a challenge for our creativity. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. <laughs> if you take a few questions, yes. just a few questions, I think. Do you have any comments? And this was amazing, Amanda. Work, vision, creativity, saving us all at once. <laughs> once. Astounding talk today. Anybody? Any thoughts? Comments? I, have, I do have a question, which is once, like a cloud is four months, and all the buildings you design, it has to sustain the performance for the life of a buildings. Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about monitoring of buildings and how to measure to make sure that the life cycle of buildings sustains the initial design intent. Yeah, that's, that's a very critical point. Even already commissioning a building, getting a building to work as intended, because we typically do the concepts and we're trying to follow it up, but it's typically quite hard to convince a client if a building finally starts operation to get another contract to follow the building at least for like two years. But we have found, we, I think we did like 10 projects like this where we could convince the client to do it. And in a certain way, by following the operation, you really could first get the building to work as it was intended to work. And I think that's another lesson we learned out of it. Why, if you talk to mechanical engineers today, they typically are oversizing mechanical systems by factor two easily. Because they say, we don't know if the building gets an operation if everything is already working, so we, make, uh, we have to make sure there's eno enough capacity to keep the people cold, even if the building is not working as it should. We should have enough capacity to compensate for the control system, which is partially not working. So, and this is one experience that the building management system, most of our buildings go into operation and building management system is not working. Sometimes it takes a year. In big projects like Deutsche Post, Finally, the Deutsche Post, in a certain way, pulled over the project leader from ABB, which is the, was this big control company who did the control system. They bought the guy into their company to run their facility management because there was no way to get it working with their own facility management because there was not enough communication, not enough knowledge flow in between the two guys. I think that's some experience where we say, that's why a client should follow up, because why doing all this in a certain way, uh, efforts in the design, if finally in operation your building is not performing? And what is very interesting in, this is now reflecting existing buildings. I bet, and we did it here in this building, if you go to the existing buildings, we could easily save between 30 to 50% of the today spent energy just getting the systems which should work as they should work 
working instead of systems working against each other, having leaking envelopes, whatever. So in a certain way, this is where I think only, and to be honest, to see the, the development, I think only the increase of the price for energy would lead to this because then suddenly, and it's, it's already coming in Europe where energy prices are nearly double or triple uh, than here in North America, where suddenly there are companies coming up which are doing like the, I go in, I look through your building, we invest, you pay us the next five years what you would pay before we came in. So out of this kind of compensation, they made their profit because they said, we invest 100,000 euro and you save every year 50,000. So if you pay us for five years, the 50,000, and then it's yours, then you can save it. But for this five years, we get the, the grants. You know, certainly they can make out of it, a business out of it. And I think that's quite interesting that suddenly it comes into this, if the energy level uh, or the energy price is high enough, then suddenly the market, the laws of the market are just driving this, this, this uh, kind of process. And I think that's quite very important. And it's clear <clears throat> that to prove then the savings, you have to have at least a minimal monitoring system at the end to prove what, what your savings have been. And so I think we have to understand that if you buy a system and you install it, you have to follow a mechanical system. All these buildings at the end are, even the natural ventilated systems are in a certain way complex. So they had, there has to be someone who is able to know. And it's interesting, in our refurbishment for IIT Crown Hall, IIT Crown Hall, some of you have seen, has this little floor flaps at the bottom of the facade, manually operated. And when we worked on the project, they told us there was an old guy from Mies' office. When he was long retired, his daily trip was, he went for lunch anywhere down Chicago, then he took the L, was driving down to, to the building, opened up the flaps for five hours, and then he closed them at nine o'clock, and then he took the L and, and went back. And, and then he died, and then nobody ever operated the flaps again. So in a certain way, he knew that this was a kind of a, so, and we had a big discussion in the refurbishment if we would do them motorized or not. And the conclusion at the end was no. Teachers and students have to learn to live with this building and in a certain way to operate the building instead of having a, a building management system which would do the building and then people sometimes feel overruled by suddenly an electrical motor opener flap and putting a shading down. So I think, I don't, we, we have seen some energy numbers, that some performance has improved, but it's still not that big possible people, after a while, again, get lazy. Any other questions, comments? Oh, well, uh, no, it's getting late, but I yes, thank sorry. you very much for a wonderful lecture.